Uh, hello, I'm uh, Paul Dixon, as you probably know, from signing up for the course. And I'd like to welcome you to Management Science 1206, still officially called Quantitative Methods 2, but it's being rebranded finally as an introduction to data analytics for business. And I'll explain that in a minute. That, uh, and I also want to introduce you to my dog, Dora. Uh, Dora uh, came to us just at the early part of the pandemic and uh, definitely helped me through it. And she's uh, stuck with me ever since. And the image here is Hurdles Beach. And uh, Hurdles Beach is a beach along the south shore of Nova Scotia, about 15 minutes south southwest of uh, of Lunenburg. And, uh, you'll see pictures of Dora and where Dora walks on a regular basis through the course, probably at the start of every class. Uh, let's get going. So what I want to do today is tell you a little bit about who I am. I'm not sure why I need to do that, but anyway, I need to tell you about what the course is, how I'm going to be delivering the course, how your evaluation is going to be done. Um, Bit about a survey and I'll give an example of uh, what the course is sort of about uh, at the same time and let's see if we can get through that. So as to who I am, my background is not in business. I started out doing a BA at UNB a long time ago in statistics of all things and then went on to do a Master of Mathematics at Waterloo. Yes, they have a faculty of math there also in stats. And then, well, I was there, I discovered a department called Management Sciences that was fairly recently established there at, uh, at Waterloo. And uh, that's where I did my final degree. And after that, came to St. Mary's in 1979. Despite not having a business background, I did become the Dean of the Business School on an acting basis in, from 91 to 93. And then after things didn't work out with the person they hired as dean, I came back and did it for another six years, for 96 to 2002. Fun time. If you've been to campus, I got to build the Sobe building. That was a fun job. Anyway, it was one that I got to do lots of interesting things. And uh, then I got dragged back into administration again as associate vice president enrollment and registrar. And I did that for a dozen years. Uh, and I've worn lots of other hats. I've been a department chair, an associate dean, an MBA director, a director of recruitment, uh, director of our language center, all of those ones on the side as well. I was generally doing the other jobs I was supposed to be doing and a bunch of other things too. Uh, but it's been fun. I, I like change. I like variety. And uh, in fact, I didn't chase after any of these jobs. It was more the I was asked to do them. It's, uh, it's, it's been fun, it's been interesting. Anyway, but my favorite job, if I have to go back and reflect on it, has been teaching. And uh, the, uh, as I finished my time in administration and decided it was time to get out in 2017, uh, rather than looking at retirement, I decided, especially after I did teaching, it was still a lot of fun, uh, that I would stay at it. And uh, since I wasn't retiring anytime soon, it meant I could afford to go on, take on a, a loan. And uh, we built the cottage that we always wanted in, uh, in Kingsburg. And that's where I am right now. That's uh, near where Hurdles Beach is. So anyway, uh, with respect to this course, Calculus is a required course at almost every business school in Canada and in the US, though that is now just starting to change. And the courses have been almost unchanged for 50 years. The one at St. Mary's really hadn't changed for 25 years uh, until I went and shook it up in 2019. And I changed it from being a math course in, uh, uh, that focused on calculus for the most part, to one that focused on data literacy. And that was an issue that I was finding in my management roles that was really absent that uh, among my staff that worked for me and in talking to other organizations the same way 
They weren't using calculus on a daily basis, but they were using data and their employees didn't understand data. So there's lots of literacies out there. They talk of math literacy, numeracy, data literacy, digital literacy. That, what are they? Um, and do you really need them? You do need them, all of them. And it's not clear on the definitions, they keep changing. But let me try to go through what I mean by it. With numeracy, we deal with numbers all the time. That, uh, that and what are numbers? We see them and we try to interpret them. But do we really understand them? Even what's reported, do we know how to interpret them properly? So uh, I'm taking an example from back when vaccination was just really moving quickly. And in Nova Scotia, we were making really good progress in getting Nova Scotians vaccinated. And you would see weekly reports online by the government about vaccination rates and the media was reporting them as well. So this is taken from one date uh, almost two years ago now in August of 2021. And it was reported that 76.6% of Nova Scotia population was vaccinated. But then as you dug into the same source, it later said that only 66.2% were vaccinated. That's confusing. Um, I looked at other sources to see what should I end take from this. And there were other reliable sources that you would see online. One of them that said 87% were vaccinated and another said 75.2% were vaccinated. These were all taken from the same data on the same date from the Nova Scotia Department of Health. So what's someone supposed to interpret as our vaccination rate? Is it 66%, 87% or some number in between? Because we were comparing provinces and countries and that sort of thing in vaccination rate. So what do we take it as? That if you were in the online, in the face-to-face -face class, we would explore this in class, but unfortunately I can't do Q and A with you online, not in a recording. It turned out they were all different definitions and there are a lot of other definitions that are floating around as well. It's uh, in this one, it was all Nova Scotians that had two doses that was viewed as fully vaccinated at that time was 66%. But not everybody was eligible at that time. I think it was only those over 18 were allowed to be vaccinated. And so if you looked at just the eligible people, it was 75%. But in other places, they would talk about anybody that had at least one dose, that was 76%. But of eligible people, that was 87%. So it made it really difficult to do comparisons uh, at least based upon media reports, because the media was terrible at giving us these definitions and uh, they would just give us a number, but you had to dig to be able to find the source and where it came from. Here's another one that just, do you understand a number? That's quite simple. So when I was uh, a kid, A&W was far and away the largest drive-in fast food restaurant and McDonald's came along sometime later. And in 1982, McDonald's introduced the very successful quarter pounder. And a and was really starting to struggle. McDonald's was really stealing a lot of business from them. So they competed with a product called Third is the Word, a one-third burger that they thought but it's gonna sell for the same price. Uh, they thought that would really improve their uh, their success in the marketplace, but it was not successful. They ended up dropping it. They brought it back in 2007 as the one third Angus burger, and that didn't work. And then somewhat later, they tried the one third sirloin, no luck at all. So, what's going on? Why weren't people buying their burger? And so, they did surveys, they did focus groups sort of thing. And what was interesting was that they would say that the taste of the burger was actually quite better. Um, but when they were asked why they bought the quarter pounder rather than the one third burger, the most common reply was, why would I buy a one third of a pound when I can get a quarter pound for the same price? This was really common response. This wasn't an unusual response. That 
Uh, now, this was Americans. Maybe Canadians would be a bit different, but I expect it would probably be the same. But consumers were convinced that a quarter is bigger than a third because four is bigger than three. We don't, most of us, a lot of us at least, are not very good with fractions and get fractions wrong. And that's what was happening here. So numbers, our numeracy skills aren't great. But the, now, into this data analytics. Why do we need to get into this with this data literacy stuff? That there's been a huge change in the last 20 years or so with respect to our ability to capture, store, and process vast amounts of data. It's a, a phenomenal change. That 20 years ago, uh, the internet was still relatively new. Uh, that our first browsers that we were using were only about 25 years ago. And uh, that uh, Netscape uh, was our first one that at least I used, and that was about 1995. So it's not that long ago. And the technology has moved very, very rapidly so that now they can capture all types of interactions that you have with an organization. They can save it all if they want to. Now it's cheap enough to do that. And that's only been recently that it's been cheaper to save things on a computer than to save it on paper. And the activity you have even has little bits of metadata so that when you're visiting a website, they may not know who you are, but they know your IP address. They know if you're looking at a phone, versus a computer. They know if it's an iPhone or an Android. They know all kinds of little, they know where you are. Um, you haven't told it anything, but it's still knowing stuff and this could be captured. Social media, you're giving away huge amounts of information. That uh, it was scary when a little over a year ago, it became apparent that an app that was being used by Tim Hortons incredibly popular a coffee shop in Canada that you could use the app to order your coffee. And the app used the GPS in your phone to figure out where you were, how long it was going to take you to get to the store to pick up your coffee. You would think that was just when you were using the app that they knew your location, but in fact, they were tapping into your location every 15 minutes, day and night, seven days a week. So they knew where you were at midnight. They knew where you were at nine o'clock in the morning. They could figure out where you worked. They could figure out where you lived. This was really, really scary that they stopped doing it. Um, but we give out a lot of data so that now it's there. You can start using it. So we hear of data analytics, data mining. This is a definition of an older term called knowledge discovery through data. And, uh, but it's, it's still the same thing. It was described as the non-trivial process of identifying valid, novel, potentially useful, and ultimately understandable patterns in data stored in structured databases. A lot of words, every one of them pretty much is important. It's non-trivial, meaning it's not simple. There is some complexity to it. So you need to know how to do it. It's a process though. It's not one single tool. It's a process that we work through. What we'd like to identify are things that are true, that are valid, that are novel, that are new to us. We've, we've not known them before. That's what we mean by novel. Potentially, it's going to be useful. Often when we're digging through, we're finding things that are interesting, but we don't know how to use them. But uh, it's still, maybe we can use it. It's something we didn't know before. That now, this definition is, is over 20 years old, uh, but we had talk of ultimately understandable patterns. Now we're into methods, actually, that we don't understand. Although we're developing new methods to take the results 
of artificial intelligence methods that we don't understand how they work and trying to find explanations for why they work. It's called explainable artificial intelligence, a whole new field. And we need the data to be stored in a database and the database needs to be structured, organized in some fashion. We've got a lot of very unstructured data that we work with and so there is a big process that the computer scientists deal with structuring that data for us. So at the end of this course, I'm not going to teach you everything. You, you can do whole degrees in this, multiple degrees in data science. So one first year course is not going to make you a data scientist. But I'd like you to have an understanding of at least one process for doing data mining. I'd like you to be aware of some of the most common applications of data mining. We're going to be using Excel through the course, and I'll show you how to use Excel, uh, that for doing data exploration and analysis, and I can't emphasize enough how important it is to be good at Excel that um, firms complain that their employees say they know Excel, but they can't do new things in Excel. They can just do it for the same things over and over again. I want you to have the capability to explore new stuff in Excel. We're gonna be exploring data, and unfortunately data has serious quality problems. We've got a lot of dirty data, incorrect data and that creates a lot of challenges for us. How do we even identify when our data isn't correct? That we're gonna look at two types of data mining applications called value estimation and classification. They're far and away the most common. And we'll look at some of the methodologies that are used in doing that. We'll look in depth at value estimation at one method and we'll do a high level survey of methods that are used in classification. And we will find to be able to understand this stuff and understand a lot of the methods, we need a basic understanding of probability or maybe a better understanding of variability. What do we mean by variability and how variability affects, interferes with effective decision making. And so it, we need that, so that's our bit of theory that's there, that's gonna be in the probability stuff. Now this course, as uh, you've already been made aware, and I presume to be able to see this video, you're on top hat, and uh, that I'm not using Brightspace. I've tried using Brightspace last fall for a course similar to this one, a um, little bit, clunkier than Top Hat. And uh, the feedback I've had from students the last three years that we've used Top Hat has been incredibly positive. It is in part driven because when I built the textbook for the course that uh, it was while well working, it was, I made an agreement to build it in Top Hat with them as a publisher as an e-textbook. I thought that was an interesting concept. And it was before the pandemic hit us, but it turned out as we got into doing things online, it became a very effective platform for doing it. But Top Hat um, didn't start out as an online teaching platform. It's a Canadian company. I believe it was a couple of students out of Waterloo that looked at the way they had, had courses using clickers. clickers I don't know if it's still used, is a technology that used to be used in classrooms where the instructor would show up on the screen some multiple choice questions and students would use clickers to answer them. They could do tests in class using these clickers that you could do the multiple choice. And the student said, why do I need a special clicker when I can do this on my phone, uh, our smartphones? And so let's build an app uh, for phones and the app grew into a whole platform for using technology in the classroom. So uh, it's similar in Brightspace. Uh, it doesn't, Brightspace has certain additional features for doing some things, uh, but it's more complicated to use. And 
I can say if, as an, someone building a course, a lot easier to build in Top Hat than it is in Brightspace. So um, I presume you've already signed up uh, and you can do the 14 free trial, trial if you like, particularly if you're not sure about taking this class. But at the end of the 14 days, you've got to purchase both access to Top Hat and the textbook. The combined cost, including tax, is about $80. So once you're in it and you've already signed up and you've gotten into it, um, you don't actually see the whole textbook. Uh, I could, I guess, release all of it to you all at once, but students told me that seeing it all at once was overwhelming. Um, there's so much material by the end of the course you're going to see online. At, and also for navigation, that we've chunked it up into 12 chapters over 12 weeks. And I'll release a chapter each week. I'll try to release them well in advance of when we're do, covering the material. I'll release chapter two very soon. And uh, by the end of the term, you'll see the 12 chapters. And you're supposed to have lifetime access to the, the textbook. So I'm not sure how that done. Um, within each chapter are 10 multiple choice questions spread through the chapter. And those form a quiz for that chapter. Um, and this term I have added a 13th quiz that's gonna be on the course outline. That it's interesting with the way these quizzes are done with each question, you get two attempts to answer each question and you can search for you know, it's open book, so you can try a question. If you don't get the right answer, you can reread the material and try a second time. That it's not a timed quiz. You just have to complete it, the first one, by next Saturday, uh, January the 14th. And you've got to complete it by midnight. And that'll be every week, Saturday at midnight, you've got to complete the quiz for that the material that was covered that week. And you can complete the question one day and then leave it and come back and complete another one another day. Um, it's not timed in that fashion. And so you should be getting like 90% or better on every quiz. But uh, students found it somewhat unusual to do this, but they, at the end, they found it forced them to read the book. And the quiz questions, uh, assisted with the learning. And that ends up being an important aspect of the way assessment has been done in the course is to foster much more your learning process than to find out how well you know the material. And uh, so the quizzes should be easy, but they get you to learn the material. The tests, every, we don't have a final exam. We don't have a midterm. Every two weeks on It'll be every second Friday, the first one being on January the 27th. There's going to be an online test. I'll open up the test at seven in the morning. I'll close it at midnight. That the uh, It'll generally cover only the previous two quizzes. That has been my pattern so far. But it is possible I could include a question from previous material. So they're different questions from what were on the quiz, but they're similar. It's the it's, it's same sort of format. You only get one attempt. You only have 60 minutes to complete the test once it's been opened. And uh, there are gonna be five of these. So there's no big cumulative exam, but the course material tends to build upon itself. So material you'll be doing in uh, test number five it's, yes, it only covers chapters nine and 10, but those chapters pull material from previous chapters. So there, it, you do, it, you can't just be tested and then forget the material again. Each test is worth eight points. So that's not a huge number of points, but it's enough to change your grade significantly. So you do all the tests. 
every week I'll post a discussion question. There's one that's been just posted already. They're not technical ones. There isn't necessarily a right answer to the discussion questions. They get you to reflect upon course material. And this again is a learning technique by reflecting upon material and thinking about it in terms of what you've heard in the media or what's happened in your personal life helps you internalize and remember the material much better. That uh, grading is just based upon participation. If you participate in the discussion, you get two thirds of a point for doing that. There are 12 discussions. So in total, you could get eight points for doing all 12 discussions. And uh, if your discussion score is better than your lowest test score, then I'll replace your lowest test with your discussion score. Uh, it doesn't take you much time to do it. It's great insurance because you never know when you're gonna have a bad test. And uh, regardless, if you do every, all 12 discussions, you get eight points, you get 100%. So uh, it's worth doing it. But it's, it's done in part as a memory technique. But you will find it interesting because you can see the responses of all the other students uh, that have done that discussion as well. And it's interesting to look at what they have to say on it. And uh, I do encourage you to look at other points of view. We'll still have assignments. Again, an important part of learning is to practice, to apply your learning. So we're going to do five assignments. They are somewhat challenging. Uh, there are lots of little tasks you end up having to do. They're due every two weeks and they're on the due on the Fridays that you don't have a test. The first one is going to be due on Friday, February the 3rd. All have assigned it at least a week in advance. That uh, I'd say four out of five assignments are based upon Excel. And so they, uh, if you are scared of Excel, don't worry. I'll show it to you in class and within the text as well. There are a variety of how-to videos on the different things to be, be covered as well. The assignments will lead you through, like I said, data mining is a process. The way the course has been sequenced is to follow a particular process for doing data mining projects. And the assignments help you go through those different stages of doing a project. Uh, though we will not have a project in the course. We tried it once and it, it, we had a lot of problems. So we, uh, we haven't decided to do that again. Um, maybe we will in the future. So we've got quizzes, 20 points, tests, 40 points, discussions, eight points. That's optional to replace your lowest test. And assignments, also 40 points. In the past, students who did almost all the activities passed the course even when they did poorly on some of them. That the, if you do all of them, uh, getting an A is a very realistic objective. For, I'd say for any student, even those that are not good at math, you can do it. The students that have failed or gotten a D in the course because they didn't do the tasks. There are a lot of them, they're 35 altogether. They're small. Students say that they are manageable. Okay, that they do not find the workload onerous, but you've got to keep on top of things and you've got to manage your time well. You've got to be doing things three days a week, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, you will have things due. You've probably already received an invitation to participate in a student survey. I sent it out earlier today. Um, it's uh, The survey is similar to ones I've uh, given to classes in previous years and that will merge your responses with that of other surveys and assignments one and two are going to involve analyzing patterns in that and you may find it interesting to learn about past and current student demographics and issues I'll remind you a little more about that survey in day two that uh, but uh, they ask, it's 10 minutes of your time. That's all it takes. And fortunately, we've had very high participation rates in the past. 
And it's been quite interesting to see how students have changed. The first survey was done in the winter of 2020. And it was before uh, the pandemic became obvious to us. So students did it in January that uh, the real impact of the pandemic started to show up in late February or March. And then we've had the issues of the pandemic since then, moving online and, and so on. So it's been quite interesting to see how the pandemic affected things like student demographics. It's a different group of students we have today, or it's changed over time, that their how their mental health has changed, their performance, their grades, their finances, a whole bunch of different things have changed over time. And the surveys help illustrate those changes that we've seen. So um, what I'd like to do is go through an example. And I'd like you to watch a video. And if I play it to you right now, unfortunately, the audio from the recording doesn't come across in the recording. So I'd ask you to pause the, uh, this recording at the moment. And in the PowerPoint that I've given you, or in the textbook, go and click on the link to this video and watch that and then come back again. Okay. So I'm presuming you've come back. That, whoops, that the uh, video is only what, three minutes long. If you didn't watch it, fine, I'll try to give you a summary of what's there. And it's uh, the video is by a guy that was promoting his book on um, uh, understanding habits and the power of habit. And uh, But he does talk about an instance with Target department stores. And he wrote an article in 2012 uh, about this particular situation in Target and got published in New York Times Magazine and has been that and, and this little video clip has been very widely circulated. Many people come back to this as an example of what data analytics is all about. And it's a really good story, I think. So it starts out talking about Andrew Pohl who had just started working at Target department stores in 2002, when two colleagues from the marketing area stopped by his desk and asked if we wanted to figure out if a customer is pregnant, even if she didn't want us to know, can you do that? What? Strange question. So Andrew was, was a statistician and that was what his department was supposed to do is to analyze data. So, he gave it just a, a bit of background target you may not be familiar with. It was in Canada briefly, and then it closed because it failed in the Canadian market. Uh, target had taken over the former Zeller stores. Uh, that's a Hudson Bay company that was a store like Walmart. And uh, Walmart beat up Zellers and drove them out of business. Target came in. Target is much like Walmart. Uh, but again, it couldn't compete with Walmart, Walmart in the Canadian market. It still is successful in the U.S. market. So that the most of us have shopping habits that we we do the same things over and over and over again, and we don't change them very frequently. We stick to the same things. That. Uh, with Target shoppers, they found that customers bought certain things at Target, uh, but for other things, they went somewhere else. Like Walmart has a grocery store, but I don't shop for groceries there, though I may shop at Walmart for other types of things. I'll do my grocery shopping at, at Sobeys, say, or No Frills, or Superstore. That Target was the same way. It found that customers only bought certain things there and they'd like to encourage them to broaden their shopping habits. And trying to do that is really, really hard to do. That, but when important events happen in our lives, things that disrupt our lives, we change a lot of habits or we're open to change. 
that if you move to a new city, if you started a new job, if you uh, started a family, then things are changing in your life. And you may be more open to change when that happens. It's a marketing opportunity. So you try to take advantage of it. Now we disclose a lot of personal information about us every day. We do that through social media, loyalty cards, doing things on the web. We leave a lot of fingerprints around that we may not be aware that we're doing. And at Target, they had some expectant mothers uh, sign up for the baby registry. Now, what's a baby registry? That when you're expecting a baby, you have friends and family that want to buy presents for you gifts help you out with that but they don't know what you need and they don't know what other people are buying for you so what you might do is sign up with what's called a baby registry at selected stores and say hey i've got a baby registry at babies r us or this place or that place but uh target as well has a baby registry because many people shop at target walmart probably has a baby registry as well that and when you sign up, you indicate who you are, that what are things you need maybe, and uh, but you're also telling them when's the baby due. They link that to what else they know about you because you've got, probably got a customer, lo a customer loyalty card. You've got your target card. And so they can, now they can add to all the customer data that they've got on you from the past, all that sales data, that you are pregnant and when your baby is due. And they can also then figure, count backwards and figure out when you became pregnant. So they can figure out your sales history before you were pregnant, during your pregnancy, after your pregnancy. And they can look at how that behavior changes. So that's what Andrew Cole started doing. He started digging through all the data on customers in that database of those customers that had signed up for the baby registry. And he then compared that behavior to behavior of customers that weren't pregnant. So some of the things that they saw was after three months, pregnant women started buying larger quantities of unscented baby lotion. And then uh, during the first 20 weeks, they started loading up on vitamin supplements like calcium, magnesium, zinc, and so on. Closer to the due date, they started buying things like scent-free soap, hand sanitizer, <coughs> wash, cotton balls. These are probably things they didn't buy before, or at least not in the quantities they bought previously. Paul found... 25 products that when analyzed could be used to create a pregnancy prediction score. So when he analyzed those 25 products for those that were pregnant and those 25 products for those people that weren't pregnant, because remember they're, most of their customers weren't pregnant women, um, they could look at the difference between the two and they could build a model that might be able to predict whether or not you were pregnant. And they could also as they move through, estimate that due date quite accurately. That, and even those predictions, those would change during the pregnancy as time went on. They could refine them as they got more data about that pregnant customer. Well, they were able to identify tens of thousands of customers that were likely pregnant. Hey, this is good. Um, they didn't know about that before. That Target as a company didn't know those tens of thousands. So how could they use that data? Well, they know your other shopping habits. They know what type of marketing promotion you respond to best. Is it emails, coupons, discounts, special events, those sorts of things. This is really sort of creepy. So they were able to take this stuff, build a model, and also build other models based upon your other behavior and influence your shopping behavior. And this was very, very, very strange. If you watch the video, you'll find out how it creeped out one parent 
a father came into Target store in Minneapolis, I think, screaming for the the store manager, or a strip off the store manager, saying, are you trying to get teenagers pregnant? The manager was like, what? Said, you are sending all kinds of marketing promotions to my daughter that she's in high school and you're sending her promotions for baby products. You're encouraging her to become pregnant. Seeing like how wonderful it is to be a mother. That what are you doing? Well, the manager knew nothing about this. He was quite taken aback, quite shocked. Um, he was very apologetic. Um, and the customer ended up leaving. The manager um, phoned the customer about a week later, just as follow up again to apologize and see if there was something they could do to make it up to him. And the uh, customer responded, well, maybe I should be the one apologizing. It seems there are some things been going on in my household I didn't know about. My daughter's pregnant. That it really is creepy that Target marketing department knew his daughter was pregnant before the family knew she was pregnant. This is really, really unnerving. Um, but it shows how successful they were with this data mining tool they built. So, um, well, you know, you're not made, you're not going to be building these models, but you should be start thinking about some of the questions to ask in a data mining problem. Like, what is the business problem, the opportunity? What is it we're trying to do? And what is that compared to a data analytics problem? So they want to increase sales. They want to change customer behavior. But converting that to a data analytics problem, that was like, which of our customers are pregnant? They need it much more specific. We'll talk about this more day two. We needed to know what is it that the client really needs. The client, in this case, the marketing department, wanted that list of customers that were potentially pregnant. How do they measure success? Well, it was being able to change the behavior of at least some customers that they couldn't do previously. We have to think about what actions we take, how we'd use that information. We've got to think about these sorts of things. In analyzing this problem, so when you're doing the problem and building the model, you may need to be thinking about these sorts of things. How are you going to use the results? Because it'll affect the way you do the modeling. You need to understand who are the actors. There's the marketing people, the statisticians, store managers, customers. And they all have different roles to play in this problem that you've done. You got to think about what type of data uh, would we need to be able to answer these questions? And where would we get the data? And sometimes we've got some of it, some of it we may have to go out and collect. Um, it may be we don't have the data today to be able to do things, but if we start collecting some new information that we'll be able to use it in the future. So maybe we can't address this problem this year, but maybe we can do it next year. We'll need to think about what types of models we could use. What does a model really look like? We'll start talking about that. That the we need to understand success. Uh, what does it look like? How accurate are predictions? And does it really matter to us how accurate they are? It may not. That uh, we need to know how we'd implement things and what types of issues. Like Target had issues in implementation of this one because they creeped out their customers. They ended up having to change the way they sent promotions out. So they hid the baby stuff in a promotion for a variety of products and inserted more baby stuff in that type of thing. But people didn't realize that they were being marketed to primarily to sell baby products. What unnerves me is this story started 20 years ago. What do you, th and they were doing this almost 20 years ago. I'm not sure when they implemented this, but it was a long time ago. What do you think they're doing today? What do they think 
co companies know about you today. It's really unnerving. Why do you need to know this? Why should you care? Well, we need to figure out what exactly you need to know to be able to do this. And who needs to know about this? Increasingly, we're seeing all kinds of different groups saying, oh my God, we need to know this. Accountants, uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, Canadian accountants, they changed the requirements or sort of the body of knowledge you needed to be familiar with to become a CPA, a Chartered Professional Accountant. And they added data analytics into that mix. That uh, survey is done by the Conference Board of Canada that of what are the most important skills, emerging skills that you're finding that your employees do not have. And uh, if we look back five years ago, data analytics wouldn't have been in that sort of thing, but where are the skill shortages, which are, what are the missing skills? Data analytics, data science is now number one. It's moved to the top of their list. But depending upon the type of function you have, the amount of skill you need will vary. But increasingly, it's become important. You have to have at least broad familiarity. So that's what we'll do in this course, is build that just that basic understanding. Um, but we're not going to make you technical specialists. That the, at the end of this course, hopefully you have um, a good appreciation for what went on at Target, and the different dimensions that went on there and the importance of data analytics and management decision-making. It's only increasing. It's um, exponential growth we've seen in this field. And uh, everyone, including myself, is playing catch up on terms of the way that this is moving way, way, way too fast and faster than universities are teaching it for sure. So day two, uh, we're gonna introduce some of the most common data mining applications and start talking about a common process that's used. How do you start a data mining project and what steps should you work through to complete that project? And then we're gonna be following that process through the uh, chapters two through 12 in the text, uh, roughly follows that sort of process for doing data mining. So I hope you, uh, got something out of this. I think this is my last slide. And uh, if you've got questions, start emailing me because you really don't have an easy forum for interaction like I do when I'm in a classroom. So you're gonna have to help me there in terms of me understanding, giving me data in a sense of what's working and what's not working in this course. Okay, take care and uh, I'll see you or you'll see me again in day two. Take care.